Maui's four brothers never allowed him to go fishing with them, but he so desperately wanted to. So, one day he began weaving a fishing line that he enchanted with an incantation to make it strong. He attached to this line a hook that his grandmother had given him, and the night before his brothers went fishing, he hid in their canoe. Once his brothers were far from the canoe, Maui baited his hook with his own blood and cast his line. Suddenly, there was a violent tug, and Maui surfaced a great fish, and his brothers returned, and they tore into the flesh of the beast, creating the mountains and valleys of North Island, and the canoe that was left there became South Island. The Maori people migrated onto the islands in several waves from Polynesia, but they had to adapt to a different kind of lifestyle, as the weather here was more temperate than tropical like the islands from which they came. Due to the isolation of the islands, this was one of the final places to be settled by humans. Originally, the Maori were a nomadic people who hunted the moa bird native to New Zealand, but eventually they settled and made more stationary tribes focused on agriculture. The Dutch explorer Abel Tasman would be the first European to sight New Zealand, thinking that it was the fabled land of the south, Terra Australis, he had sent his men ashore to go collect water, but on their way in, they were attacked by the Maori people, who killed four. Recent discoveries show that where the Dutch tried to land was a major agricultural center, so the Maori attacked these new people in defense of their vital food source. Later, several canoes came towards Tasman's ship, so shots were fired, killing one and damaging the canoe. Seeing that they were not welcome there, the Dutch left the islands. The next expedition to reach New Zealand would be James Cook's, which landed around Poverty Bay. According to Cook's journal, he saw canoes upon the shore and wanted to meet these people. So, he landed and tricked inward, leaving a few of his men to guard his landing craft. Some Maori people appeared before the men guarding the boats. They shot their muskets above their head twice. They didn't react, so they shot at them once, killing one. Cook, hearing these gunshots, ran back and they returned to their ship. Many Maori amassed on the shore later that day, and Cook planned to make amends. Upon landing, the native people wanted the Europeans' weapons, and one stole a sword from an officer. This Maori man would be shot and killed. The rest fled. They would only return in an attempt to recover the body, but more shots were fired. Cook wanted to befriend the native people, so the next day he tried to land once again. On his way in, he saw a canoe full of Maori people. His translator called to them, saying that they meant no harm, but they began to flee. So to try to get them to surrender, one of Cook's men shot a musket round above their heads. But they reacted with anger, which resulted in three Maori dead and three captured. These three got along splendid with the Europeans, and Cook used them alongside gifts to prove to the Maori people that they came in peace. And this fourth encounter finally ended with none killed. James Cook went on to map New Zealand, identifying that it was an archipelago and not the Terra Australis that many had hoped it to be. On his second voyage, Cook lost his sister ship, and their rendezvous point was the point of Queen Charlotte's Sound. Here, trade relations began with the Maori, and continued on his third voyage. Over the next period of time, New Zealand became a hub for English and French whalers and sealers, who were soon followed by traders and missionaries. These people settled amongst and alongside the Maori. Trading with the Europeans introduced the natives to muskets, which opened the doors to new wars to make up for past defeats upon tribes who hadn't acquired the weapons yet. New Zealand further developed into a lawless land that the French had up for a new colony. So, the English swooped in and drafted the Treaty of Waitangi. This treaty allowed for the Moari to maintain control of their lands and gave them the full rights of a British subject, while giving England political control of the islands. This treaty was taken around the lands to be signed by around 550 chiefs of Maori tribes, and a New Zealand government was established in Wellington. The New Zealand Wars now began between the British and the Maori, when the New Zealand Company attempted to clear natives off of their land because they had forged a document saying that they had bought the land from the Maori. This would result in an armed conflict that the Maori won, and later investigations would prove that the New Zealand Company was at fault. This would be the only battle of the New Zealand Wars to occur on South Island. The next event of the New Zealand Wars was the Flagstaff War, where a flagpole that had once flown the colors of the United Tribes of New Zealand now flew the Union Jack. This represented British colonialism and oppression, and so was chopped down three times by the local Maori. The fourth time, there were guard posts erected, so the native people had to kill the guards to get at the flagpole. At the same time, a local town was set fire to and raided as a distraction, and afterwards, they all fled into the forest to some fortifications. In response, the British set fire to and destroyed a neutral Moari village. Two English regiments landed to destroy the Moari who had conducted these attacks, and once they arrived at the fortifications, they attempted a full frontal assault, but it failed because they lacked heavy artillery to take down the Palisades. Even once they did have cannons, this did nothing against the Palisades, and the second siege only ended once the Maori abandoned in favor of a better encampment. The third siege on the new fortifications was successful, but only because the native people didn't expect an attack on a Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. Elsewhere, another false document was forged to try to take Maori land, this was once again deflected, but not without its consequences, as a force of around 14,000 amassed and demanded that the natives declare allegiance to the crown. 
none did. So, they were attacked and their land seized for English farmers. So, they began confiscating native land and approached their campaigns with a scorched earth policy against Maori villages. They also began attacking peaceful and neutral villages to deter any further resistance. Battles continued with Maori who were defending their land and their sovereignty. But, the New Zealand wars eventually concluded with around 16,000 kilometers squared of Maori territory confiscated. The loss of these lands spiraled the native communities into poverty. And still to this day, Maori people are fighting to regain the lands that were unjustly confiscated during these wars. New Zealanders began an outcry for more independence from England, and after some toiling, gained a constitution and an elected government. But England still controlled their foreign affairs, giving New Zealand the title of Dominion. And now, with all this new land confiscated from the natives, Europeans found gold, which caused a gold rush that doubled New Zealand's population. With this new influx of settlers, the islands began to focus on improving infrastructure by building a new railway, new telegraph wires, and improving roads. However, these endeavors were halted by a major depression that gave rise to a very liberal government. In a world ruled by classism, New Zealand was an anomaly, as they had very little class distinction. This allowed them to elect a very liberal government, which was uncommon for the time. This government gave women the right to vote, making New Zealand the first country to do so. It also made many labor reforms which were very ahead of its time, such as minimum wages and maximum hours. Now, the world erupted into war, and New Zealand was pulled in alongside Great Britain without a say, and the nation soon mobilized the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. This army was first tasked with conquering German Samoa, which they did without a single shot, and after a day, they proclaimed victory. They were next sent to train and muster in Egypt alongside the Australians to form the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZAC. They, alongside other Commonwealth forces, mostly from the British Raj, fended off an attack from the Ottoman Empire on the Suez Canal. The ANZAC now prepared for an attack on Constantinople, but on their way there, there were navigational errors, and they ended up not on the gentle beaches that they trained for, but at the base of steep cliffs and harsh terrain. They fought hard to land, and once they were set up, they found that they could not advance and were trapped because of the perfect defense the cliffs gave the Ottomans. They were forced to retreat back to the sea. This battle is commonly seen as the birth of the nation of New Zealand, as they fought with vigor, although to little success. It defined the country and evoked a wave of nationalism and a sense of identity among the vast territories of the British Empire. The Anzac also helped with the Palestinian campaign, where they helped the British take control of Jerusalem and Jordan. At the same time, New Zealanders trained in England for the European campaign, and their first fighting would be at the Battle of the Somme. But they would truly define themselves militarily when they took the Messin Ridge and the town of Messin. The soldiers would go on to fight in Passchendaele and defend against the German Spring Offensive. Now that the war was over, New Zealanders pushed for independence and got the right to decide their foreign affairs, while staying close enough to Britain that they controlled their defense. The Great Depression hit, and another wave of left-leaning political views followed, making New Zealand a welfare state with free education, free healthcare, etc. The Second World War began, and New Zealand was there from the beginning, declaring war alongside Britain this time. There was a general fear of Japanese expansionism, so there was a strong home army in the chance that Japan eyed up the archipelago. In this war, the New Zealanders made up their own section of the Allied army, rather than being intermingled with the Australians and they would see their first fighting in Greece against the Italian invasion. Once the defense collapsed, the army retreated to the island of Crete to prepare for German paratroopers. But, once the Germans were dropped, they immediately took key positions, and the New Zealanders were forced once again to retreat, this time to Egypt. The army would go on to fight in North Africa, where their proudest moment came, causing the first German land defeat of the war at the Siege of Tobruk. They would continue to fight into Italy until the end of the war. Now that the war was over, New Zealand began a pro-American policy as they signed ANZUS, which was a mutual defense and military cooperation treaty signed between Australia, New Zealand, and the US. A period of rapid urbanization now occurred where two-thirds of the New Zealand population lived in urban areas. New Zealand was forced to carve a national identity and push away from their close ties to Britain as they joined the European Union, which essentially cancelled trade between New Zealand's largest market. Also, the island citizens were tired of the constant nuclear tests happening in the Pacific that docked in New Zealand ports. So, the government was forced to block access to all American ships as they had a policy of secrecy with cargo. This annulled the ANZUS Treaty for New Zealand, but they stayed strong in the face of such a great power, and eventually they made New Zealand a nuclear-free zone. This also forced them to make closer ties with Oceanic Island nations and Australia. The government began rights activism and passed many social justice laws, such as homosexuality legalization and the gender pay gap reduction. New Zealand now sent troops into Afghanistan to aid in the invasion, and into East Timor as a pro-democracy force defending the right to independence. There was now an economic shift to focus more on tourism rather than farming, but exports of beef and wool still remained very important. Two mosques were attacked by lone gunmen. 
injuring 49 and killing 51, making it the deadliest terror attack in New Zealand history. This attack was conducted by semi-automatic rifles, with two undetonated car bombs nearby, and was partly streamed on Facebook. This began an outcry against gun ownership and the growing popularity of Islamophobia. Many banded together to support the victims of the shootings through fundraisers and donations. Street gangs across New Zealand defended mosques from further attacks in defiance.